I'm Christina Rea, and welcome to Breaking Out of Breaking In, a practical filmmaking podcast about taking your creative career into your own hands and making great work that gets seen without playing the Hollywood game. Or at least while changing the rules. Hi, I'm Brie Castellini, your other co-host, and today we are talking to Nora Poggi, a film producer and host of the podcast Creative Distribution 101. This episode is part of our Women in Film podcasting crossover series. Without further ado, welcome, Nora. Thanks for, uh, for resp- talking to us today. Hi, thank Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, what do you do? What do you make? Who is Nora Pochi? Well, I am a documentary filmmaker and impact producer. So I made a feature doc called She Started It with NCS And we both worked on it for a couple of years. It was about women tech entrepreneurs. And it was a massive endeavor. It took years. And then we were on the road with it for years. And so I learned the basics, I guess, of uh, creative distribution and impact campaigns by doing it myself. And then I was like, not only is it very important, it's it's a way to, you know, have uh, revenue streams, have more control over your work and create impact if you care about that, which a lot of doc makers do. But also I was shocked by the lack of information and just the, the barrier to entry. And, and I was like, this mm-hmm. information should be out there. I was desperate to find it. So I was like, I'm just going to start a podcast about this. And it's very niche, but apparently some people, you know, want to learn about this. So th- thank you to them. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. and that's a great segue into, could you describe your podcast in two sentences? Creative Distribution 101 is about alternative creative paths to distribution. So what does that mean in practice? So we interview filmmakers and experts who have distributed their film in an untraditional way. And by untraditional, I mean, you know, if you've uh, interviewed Liz Manischel, who was my, my first episode, who used to run the Creative Distribution Fellowship at Sundance, it's really kind of splitting your rights and trying to exploit every window, whether it's broadcast, educational, community screenings, like semi-theatrical, digital, Mm -hmm. and just not giving all your rights to one entity. But then um, I also really like the term impact distribution. So a lot of people um, that I, you know, interviewed, and also because I care about that, are really focused on impact. And I would say not just documentary filmmakers, but people who have, you know, films where they're trying to reach an audience to, you know, create some sort of impact. And so the idea is to not just worry about revenue streams and ownership of your work, but also how you can reach audience, connect with people and and hopefully have the film achieve what you set out to do. That's great. Yeah, I when we were just starting this podcast, we talked about doing a distribution episode and we did do one on shorts and web series, but when we were talking about a feature one, I was like, I don't even know how to condense that into an episode because it is so, there's just so much to unpack about how distribution functions within the industry and then like how you can do your own thing in so many different ways. And I was like, really, they should just be listening to Nora's podcast if that's what they want. <laughs> and so, so we sweet. we talked very early on about having you on to, to talk about just everything you've learned from the podcast. And so I'm glad we've been able to fit this into our new series, Uh highlighting women podcasters in film. That's awesome. Thank you. I mean, yeah, we met because you you were running distribution workshops, I think, for Seed and Spark, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I know you, you know a lot about that. I think I really focus on that kind of like niche of creative distribution, which I guess is not so much a niche anymore, but just because I think at the core, what I'm really passionate about because I've been through it is filmmaker autonomy and sustainability Mm -hmm. and it just it just bothers me to no end to see and I was just at Doc NYC just to see so many talented people who are desperate for or Netflix or HBO and like it's just going to be one percent of the people out there who get that and there are so many awesome films that have a story and that have an audience like people also I feel like reaching knowing how to reach your audience is part of what we do as storytellers of what we should be doing so Mm -hmm. that's right really so when you were working on your first film Nora were you like had you come out of film school like what is your background bringing you to your first feature and now impact producing overall what's your journey I did not go to film school and my film was my film school. So yeah, I went to school for political science in France where I'm from. I'm born and raised in Paris and I went to Sciences Po, which is a political science school. And I really wanted to be a journalist. That's what drew me to documentary. And I'm still, I think, kind of, you know, really wanting to 
focus on journalism stuff and the the film was really kind of ser- serendipity thing of I've always been passionate about filmmaking and my co-founder in CSI it had a very similar background she went to Columbia J school and she also interned at you know film companies where we both had that passion and I think we it was 2013 when we met we didn't really know it was a thing to like that making a doc could combine all of these things and we had never done it so we kind of took the leap and we're like, you know, as we were covering the tech space and as journalists, we were meeting women in this field and telling their stories and kind of noticing the lack of diversity in the field. It kind of started, uh, you know, gear, um, turning our gears in terms of the journalism side of things. Of like, okay, there's an uncovered story here. And then we're like, what? why not make a film, you know, because that's what we would really like to do. And we learned by doing, I guess. <laughs> that's so cool. I mean, we hired a lot of great people. We had to fundraise to hire some professionals, obviously. And that was the hardest part, the fundraising part. <laughs> right. Always is. <laughs> yeah. So so from there, now you're uh, like, what, what is your day job now? Is impact producing your, your full time work? How are you uh, making ends meet these days? We try to be transparent on the podcast oh, yeah. about that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, you should be transparent. So when I was making the film, so she started, took us about five years from start to finish. But then let's see, we started in 2013. But then we were, we, the film was released in 2016. But then we toured for about two years. And while I was making the film, I had a job, uh, which was like, I was doing journalism, like correspondent for French newspaper and another thing for AFP. So I was working nonstop because making a film is a full-time job and I had two other Mm -hmm. jobs. So it was hard, but you know, that's what we do. Then when the film got released in 2016, I was able to live off of the campaign. So if you look at, you know, the numbers you're like oh great you were doing great like you know we were um negotiating speaking engagements for like 2500 plus travel or you know Mm -hmm. selling tons of school licenses at 350 a piece but the reality is that it doesn't take into account number one the money you injected into the project right you're basically getting back that money so now it looks like you're you know having passive income but it's actually not really passive income because you invested Mm -hmm. in it and also doesn't take into account like the sweat equity of just like putting yourself out there and, and trying to do this outreach work. So ultimately, you know, it, it worked out and I was lucky then for two years to live off of that, but it would have been nice to have a grant or something. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then afterwards, starting in 2019, the past two, I guess more than three years, I started really doing impact work as a full-time thing. And I was working for different clients like, um, you know, I worked for uh, The Tale, the HBO film by Jennifer Fox. They had a great oh, wow. team with, yeah, they that had a great a team great with film. Picture Motion and Together Films. And I was part of that team. And uh, and then I was, I met a filmmaker at Doc NYC called Joanna James, who made a film about women chefs, A Fine Line. And I worked, I've been working with her for three years. I mean, I can't believe that. She was a client. Wow. Now, now, you know, she's my boss. Uh, so... <laughs> I, you know, I, I still try to freelance for other campaigns if I can, but um, I was not expecting to kind of focus on just one client, but it, it kind of turned out that way that she had a lot of stuff that she was able to do. A lot of campaigns, you know, last six months to a year. It's hard to have funding for it. And she was lucky that she could sustain herself. That's amazing. Yeah. So can you walk us through like what you do as an impact producer on these projects as both full time and kind of freelancing? Like what it, what is your day to day job function generally? So in general, it's really I used to kind of just do a little bit of consulting. So, for example, if a, because taking on a campaign like I've been doing for Joanna is a, is a whole other ball game, a lot sure. of work. So mm-hmm. I would say in general, it's like a lot of consulting of like, OK, let's have a, a call and figure out what are your goals as a filmmaker, like all the preliminary work of how to strategize for a campaign, which a lot of other people do a great job at like Loki Loki Pictures or Mia Bruno or you know Liz there's so many awesome people who do that but so I would do these consultations and then I would say I can train an intern for you if you don't have the money to hire someone because hiring someone to run a campaign is a whole other ball game because like I said it's a lot of work so I advocate for filmmakers in a sustainable uh, sustainable way to just hire an intern 
get that person trained by someone like us who can give you the basics. And then the reality is that it's a lot of admin work and outreach. Like it's a lot mm-hmm. of sending emails and being organized. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. But then for uh, Joanna, I took on her campaign and I've been working with her for three years. She ended up building a nonprofit. So it, it's kind of taken off uh, beyond the film. And I guess now I'm co-running this nonprofit with her. So a lot of it is, you know, programming. So, you know, planning conferences, planning events, you know, membership. How do we get more members? How do we help them get what they need, which is women in the food system? And also um, working on uh, impact in the policy realm. So we did a lot of advocacy and lobbying for paid leave, which is a huge issue for women in the restaurant industry. And, mm-hmm. you know, you can use the film for that. Like we screened the film Capitol Hill, but you ha- there's so other, so many other things that are take a sh- really a lot of work. I was going to swear a lot of work. You can totally like, you swear. Know, yeah, you can swear. <laughs> a shit ton of work. Like, you know, for example, when the pandemic hit, we were kind of thrown in the moment of a lot of the people in the restaurant industry have never organized or unionized. And the IRC, which is the Independent Restaurant Coalition, was formed out of necessity during the pandemic, like really like, but it didn't exist. And so we scrambled all together to kind of say, we need to have emails sent to legislators about what people need. And we need to gather this community to, you know, sign those emails, sign those petitions, send them like, talk to your legislators. A lot of those restaurants, you don't know who's my mayor, who's my congresswoman or who, you know. So that's kind of stuff is what I'm most most interested in regarding impact of like actually trying to make a change on the ground. But the reality is it takes a long time. So for a film mm-hmm. campaign to be able to do that, you need resources and you need like time. Like I said, like mm-hmm. it's a couple years. You don't do that in six months to a year, which is what most campaigns have the resources for. No, that's yeah. definitely true. So for your film, you you mentioned a couple of the like small things that you guys were were doing over the course of those two years you were working on it. But can you give us a little more insight on like what did it mean to do impact distribution for yours? Like, can you talk through what you did with schools and how that worked? Like, what what were the the facets of your impact distribution plan? Yeah, totally. I think. Um, and not, not to like, if I, if I start b- being too like granular, don't hesitate to tell me because I, I kind of nerd out about this, but. Um, <laughs> no, that's great. That's why you're here. Nerd out. Yeah, you, yeah, this is your that. invitation. <laughs> it's more like, so I think one thing to really uh, focus on when you're just starting this work is really your goals. And we say a lot like, you know, impact, uh, eyeballs, money, like those three things can work together. And sometimes they don't be really honest mm-hmm. with yourself about that. And for us, we had, we cl- we really wanted the film to be seen by a lot of people, but eyeballs didn't end up becoming our main pillar. We, ne- we needed to create a certain kind of impact. That's how we got the film funded through philanthropic funds who wanted us to mm. reach, you know, schools and, and, and students. But also that's what we cared about. That's why we made the film in the first place. And we also had a revenue imperative because we were broke uh, AF. So, <laughs> so instead of pushing for, you know, like a Netflix deal or stuff like that, which, you know, at the time, you know, those d- were not really lucrative. It was like as some people got like 30K for like a licensing deal. From what I hear now, it's very different that they only take on like originals and pay a lot for it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. At the time, you could get 30K for it to be on Netflix for a year. It's just a licensing deal. Anyway, instead of doing those things, we focused on how to get the film in school. So we reached out to a lot of schools and literally like before we came on, before we had our educational distributor Grasshopper come on. And even when they were there, we negotiated to have co-exclusive because the reality is no one will care as much as you do. So we did sure. probably more work than they did, although they're great. And so we had a massive spreadsheet of, you know, entrepreneurship centers, business schools, engineering schools at all those top universities. And we started with the top universities to create our own little mini press tour. Because if you're not at Tribeca or Sundance or Duck NYC, you know, it's a bit harder to get that kind of recognition. And we were very happy mm-hmm. to premiere at Mill Valley Film Festival, which is great, but we needed more of a push to get, you know, the press. And so we targeted all those top universities like Harvard, Yale, Columbia, you name it. And we went there and that was kind of what gave legitimacy to the campaign. People were like, oh, you screen at Harvard. Like that must be, you know. So after that, we kind of 
also went through regional film festivals and at each place we kind of lumped in other stuff like so when we went to south by southwest edu their educational conference we screened there and then we booked a ton of other stuff in the area we also focused on conferences like grace hopper which was the biggest conference for women in tech google uh, sponsored us to screen there and that was a way for us to reach our intended audience and also make money Because Mm -hmm. a lot of these universities and a lot of these corporations, we screen a lot of tech companies, have resources to pay for those films and for those filmmakers and speaking engagements. And it also, like I said, checked the impact box that we needed to reach students and including in, in, you know, primary school and middle school, but, you know, high school universities and companies to talk about the lack of diversity in the tech field. Mm -hmm. So that's what we focused on. But the eyeball stuff was not, you know, it, it took a while for us to put the film online, like four or five years. Now the film is on iTunes. It was like, it was released five years ago on, you know, the semi-theatrical market, but it took five years to sure. put it on iTunes. Right. So when you're reaching out to these schools, like what, what is that? ask look like? Like, hi, we're filmmakers, we'd like to come to your school. Is it paired with like a curriculum that you design? Do you have like a panel afterwards? What is the actual event that you're pitching these schools? Yeah, I have a lot of practical advice for people, which is number one, have a assistant, which could be real or not real. uh, But basically (laughs) have another email inbox. Because the reality is that when you're a filmmaker pitching your own film, especially your speaking engagement, not only can get awkward, but it's harder to get what you Mm -hmm. want. People tend to, Hmm. yeah, and I'm sure you've done that. But it's like, oh, like I am so and so for on behalf of Christina. And, you know, that's a lot easier. And granted, we started by having those people. We had, like I said, interns or we had people we hired. But I, I really recommend doing that. And basically the pitch is, and I'm happy to send a, you know, pitch email to anyone who asks, it's kind of why the film is important, interesting for them. So really targeting the right person, like the entrepreneurship center, the business school, whatever, Mm -hmm. pitching it also like, hey, we screen at Harvard, Google, like here's some press about us and really short. And would you want to screen the film for your, for your community? Note that there's a fee associated. Can we get on the phone to talk about it? And the goal is to get the person on the phone and then you talk money. But mm. never, never share money in the first go. And but just, you know, say there's a fee associated. And then when you get people on the phone, most of the time, if you targeted them right, they're very interested because they're sure. looking for content to interest, you know, their community. So mm-hmm. so you were saying that the fees associated with those could be like twenty five hundred dollars. Is that the general range for that kind of thing? Well, so I've heard that it varies from film to film because I've talked to a bunch of people and some some people apparently like, for example, one person I interviewed on my podcast Robin Hauser Reynolds, she had the first, she was right out of the gate with the first film about the uh, the women in engineering space, like much more like the, the tech space rather than entrepreneurship, which our film was, was focused on. And so mm-hmm. she had a perfect kind of appeal to those companies when there was no content out there. And she says on my podcast, she asked for like 10 to 20K speaking engagements. I never got that just FYI, Mm -hmm. like she would go to like, and she had the Rolodex. She, you know, she's an amazing businesswoman. She had an amazing community of people who like respected her and all those companies. So she commanded a really high speaking engagement fees. For me, I think the, yeah, the highest was probably $3,000 for myself. And then the screening licenses have to be, I mean, again, it varies from film to film to film. We made them affordable uh, because we really wanted volume in that regard. So sure. for high schools, it was 150. It was just, just one screening, huh? not to buy the film. So mm-hmm. 150 for high schools. And then we lowered it to like $99, 350 for universities and uh, 500 for a corporation. It, it may seem high. It's actually really not. Like when, when you're mm-hmm. at a corporation, it's like, oh, I can do a whole event around your film for $500. Like, you know, if you're not there, I mean, like it's like really mm-hmm. cheap. And right. even for a university, 350 is totally doable. Totally. Um, high schools have less money. Sure. But um, <laughs> I heard that those, those fees varies, but we, we used the like educational distributors kind of price ranges to base mm-hmm. off of that. 
on that was kind of the range, you know. How are you facilitating the screenings if you're not there? Like, are you using some sort of service that prevents them from screening it more than once? What's the sort of security aspect of that? Mm, uh, yeah, security was, that was not really like at the forefront, but mo- mm. like we started with DVDs in 2016. It was still a thing. People shipped them mm-hmm. back. Sometimes they didn't. But we had an agreement, like we make people sign a contract and most people sign the contract and ship the DVDs back. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then it becomes hard to keep track of. So at the time we partnered with Tug, which by the way, went bankrupt and we are still owed $1,500 that was never paid back. No more, (gasps) $3,000 split in half between NC and I, $3,000. Yeah. So there's that. But they went bankrupt before they did. They did a great job at doing that. Like, and I think there's another company, I forget their names. That's where they did fulfillment, like a fulfillment house. They would ship and, mm-hmm. re- and get DVDs back. They would do all that kind of back end thing. And, and then we went to digital and we sent like a you know, private download link. And in this case, same, we had a contract. You're supposed to delete the download link and you just hope people are honest after they've signed the contract. Some people maybe only use a Vimeo link. I don't like that because it's your, you know, the internet sucks up and then your mm-hmm. event is screwed right. yeah yeah and then we had different price points for if people buy the film like if they buy it it was like four 475 it's like a it's the same it's the regular price from most educational institutions they own the film and perpetuity type of thing but if we're not there we gave them like a discussion guide like a really short like one pager here are questions you can ask your panelists or you can mm-hmm. discuss with your audience something really straightforward and we gave them a screening kit which we had planned with like, here's how you set up an event. Here's how you promote it. Here's how you, you know, your checklist. Mm -hmm. And then we did build a curriculum, like a full on curriculum for K through 12. And that was really for our high school efforts, but that's different. That, that takes a lot of time. I don't know if I would advocate for making that because it's expensive to make. And most of all, it's really hard for educators to implement those. So you really need mm-hmm. someone dedicated to helping educators implement that. And the reality is the doc industry funds a lot of these things that nobody ever uses. Mm. So, you know, unless you have a team dedicated to that, I would just do a straightforward screen discussion guide. guide. Yeah, discussion guide. Yeah, maybe some like additional things to read and watch afterwards, like a, a post like screening handout. Well, yeah. what what was helpful is like here are a list of questions. Like, so if you're if you're a teacher, or if you're if you have a panel and the filmmaker is not there, it's like what kind of questions people you know to kind of like draw on the film. Oh, in that scene, this happens. Like, what do you think about this? Like, yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. Very yeah, useful. that's really interesting. So, so mainly then your your vectors were giving people like the rights to screen it, uh, mm-hmm. and then also if you could attend, wrapping up a, a speaking fee for like a post film kind of discussion. Like you'd be a moderator. No, would you have you'd a separate be a panelist. You would give? Most of the time, you would either Got be it. a keynote, actually meaning like you're going to do a Q and A, and a lot of the time mm-hmm. that's what they want. It's just the filmmakers doing the Q and A, and and you're you have someone ask you questions. Sometimes you do it by yourself I've done workshops too like I I really pitched a lot of workshops to schools which I loved doing like that was my favorite Mm -hmm. part but sometimes you're a panelist I have been asked to moderate I did not really enjoy that because I really liked controlling the conversation after the film I'll be honest Mm -hmm. sometimes like hear panelists and be like no (laughs) um (laughs) but sometimes you're asked to moderate and you do you know you you decide for yourself if that makes sense or not (laughs) Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. So those are the those are the primary vectors, though, of your impact distribution for your for your particular film. Then, yeah, that's um, really cool. Schools and corporations, and we did also a lot of conferences, communities, nonprofits, you know, festivals. But those were not, you know, really like a, it's a different audience, and a lot of them don't have that much money. They're supposed to, but a lot of them like the the, the fees sure. were not that high. And I think we also did a lot of work in the entrepreneurship space that at first it was not our target audience because for impact goals, it was not, you know, we didn't want to preach to the choir, but what happens when you get on tour, you start seeing who your audience really is. And it was very interesting that those people were really, really gung ho about the film because they saw their experiences reflected on screen. So, Mm -hmm. you know, any, any organization for women entrepreneurs, any groups, any meetups, whatever, they're very excited about, about the film. And it was not, you know, an audience that would have actively pursued, but actually it was awesome to see 
they could find some comfort in the film and then discuss their own issues of like, hey, we need more capital. We need more of this. We need more of that. So, yeah. So it almost became a, a vector for them to start organizing around, you mm-hmm. know, even though you were preaching to the choir, if you brought the choir together, they could maybe do, make some changes. Well, yeah, definitely. And also kind of like, yeah, like, like, as, as you say, you know, when people organize, when they get together, that's when you can really start building a little bit of like power of like, okay, what are the things we need to be advocating for? And oh, everybody's feeling like that discrimination. So it's not okay. And we, we're not in silos or by ourselves. Like, I guess you right. can... Mm-hmm the similar to what filmmakers do right entrepreneurs very similar so I think one thing I really we really wanted to do that we were not able to do lack of resources and bandwidth was we really wanted to have more of a direct impact in the VC world so we almost Mm -hmm. screened at like a venture capital conference and with those a few we did a few VC screenings but we really wanted to have more of a like ask and a and a call to action and it then, you know, we had too much work and it didn't end up happening, but we did a few screenings at venture capital firms, but I think that was another whole campaign could have been made around that because lack, sure. lack to of access to capital was one of the big issues in the film. Yeah, that makes sense. So since starting your podcast where you talk to other people who do similar things to you and different, do you have, are, are like their standout examples that come to mind of like just really creative ways that people have gotten their films out there either to get eyeballs, money and impact. So like what, what are some really standout creative <laughs> things that you've seen since um, doing your podcast? I mean, I, I've loved it. Honestly, like the podcast, I'm happy people are listening to it. I'm surprised because I could do it just for myself and I'll be so happy. Like, I just want to learn about this <laughs> stuff. Like I said, I just want to nerd out. So I'm like, this is great. Gathering all this information. And I was very impressed with a lot of people. So on the filmmaker side, because I, I really wanted to hear from some filmmakers also whose job, it, it was not their primary job, but they learned and they did some creative things. I thought, like I said, Robin did did really well with her own kind of sustainability aspect of how to earn money. And, and now she was able to then do a second film. And she was really smart about that marketing. I also love, you know, Sarah Marshman, who I interviewed, who's also a friend. And she's so good at, you know, marketing. And she's she did a lot of work around uh, her film Losing Sight of Shore. It was on Netflix, but she bought her own billboards. She's like... I'm going to promote the hell out of this if they're not going to do it. (laughs) And uh, I'm trying to think of like a specific like, because then I did interview experts in the field and they have a lot of case studies and examples. For example, you know, I interviewed Sarah Moses of Together Films or Liz Manischel of Sundance and formerly Sundance or, you know, uh, people at Picture Motion or the Raven Group, but it's kind of their job. So they have so many case studies to share right I loved the episode we did with um represent justice so for people who are not familiar just mercy the Warner Bros film with like Jamie Foxx and Michael B Jordan it's a Hollywood film it's not a doc it's like really a Hollywood film but it's an amazing impact film and from it was born this nonprofit called represent justice and it's the ideal scenario, obviously, to have the means to create a nonprofit that's going to do a lot of impact, you know, surrounding the issues connected to the film. But what I like about that episode, Gretel Trung, who I interviewed, is super specific. And she talks about how localized efforts are super important. Every filmmaker is like, I want to go to Capitol Hill. Number one, it might not do anything. Like you could have like three, you know, legislators in there who don't care. And Mm -hmm. also it's not that easy. What matters is the local impact. It doesn't mean you can't do a national campaign, but you have to start looking in your own backyard. And like, that's what she talks about. She said, we focused on Ohio, this one specific case, and they had so much local impact by meeting the judges and kind of working there in that one specific area. And I think we have to kind of look more at the low hanging fruits, but also like local issues before kind of having massive national goals, especially if you don't have a lot of resources. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I mean, it's it, advice that I'm sure we all give to filmmakers on the narrative and doc sides of like, don't go straight for Sundance. Like, what are the local festivals that you can have more impact at that you can actually like 
have a chance to get into at the beginning of your career and start having conversations that will move you further. It's it's all about that start small, get big later. I think people want to skip the line, but mm-hmm. it might end up doing them a disservice. Well, I mean, yeah, totally. I, at the same time, like I, I think, you know, there's no, there's nothing wrong with dreaming big and, and trying for all those things. It's more like you said, being strategic. And mm-hmm. when it comes to impact, it's really like, it's a lot of work. It's really hard. Most of the time you have zero money to do it and you're exhausted. So you have to think super strategically about your resources and your energy. And also when it comes to policy and impact, like, local issues are sometimes where you can actually make the most difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And politics takes a long time and filmmaking takes a long time. So using filmmaking to affect politics (laughs) probably takes triple or quadruple the amount of time. So, you know, be prepared to be in this world for a long time. Sounds like is what you're kind of saying. True. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. So to zoom out for a second, obviously, we are having you here to just talk about creative distribution, which is a a topic that both Christina and I wanted to learn more of. So you're the ideal guest for that. But also you're a fellow uh, podcaster and filmmaker. So on just like a a technical level, like what does it take to make an episode of Creative Distribution 101? Like what, how much time are you spending? Do you have a team, other, you know, people behind the scenes? What's, what does it take? Uh, I'm laughing just because I'm in the I'm in the weeds right now. I'm in the trenches and I'm just like, yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, (laughs) I don't know. Um, (laughs) I mean, to be really honest, it is pretty chaotic. The part that goes well is that I am extremely passionate about it. So, you know, it's just fun for me to do. It's like, I'm excited Mm -hmm. about it. And Chad uh, Liffman, who's uh, my co-producer, is also passionate about film. So that's great. And we have fun and we get along. What's difficult is just it's a passion project and we kind of had to learn everything by doing. I I didn't know about editing. I didn't know about anything about podcasting before I did it. And um, it took a second to kind of understand the organization. And I would love to hear from you kind of best practices because (laughs) it took me like a year and a half to figure out, oh, I should really have a proper schedule for seasons and record stuff in advance and like plan you know limited seasons so I'm not constantly bugging guests and I can have a hiatus without people thinking she disappeared for six months what happened so Mm -hmm. it took me a while to figure that out but I would say for an episode like right now we're about to drop a season on fandom which is a little bit of a departure but it's just like it's a guilty pleasure like I was like no I love I'm part of a lot of online communities I was like it makes sense it does. It's about audience mm-hmm. building and community. So I don't care. I'm going to throw that Absolutely. in there. <laughs> so yeah. we're about to drop that season, but it was a bit chaotic because we had limited time. I was gone all summer. I was back home in France. And then it took longer than expected because I had lofty goals. I was like, I want for the first time, not just to have interviews, which are take time to edit, but are pretty straightforward. And that's already mm-hmm. a lot of work. <laughs> I was like, oh, I really want to do this. A few episodes that are like, like my favorite NPR shows. And I'm like, okay, now I'm in the weeds. I have, it's like making a documentary. It's like you have tons of, you know, sound bites and things, you're scripting things. And I'm like, it's it's a lot of work. But most of the time, like for the previous season, which was about community, we mm-hmm. had five people and that was super sustainable. We had five awesome people. We edited those interviews in advance and we prepared the Instagram posts in advance. And that was great. This one is a bit like more rich. There are more people, so it just takes more time. Yeah, no, it it it's true. I mean, you know, you have the the difficulty of obviously yours is a much more like informational interviewee, different people with different expertises each time. So like that's just a lot more complicated. Christina and I have the the benefit certainly of like first of all being co-hosts. So Mm -hmm. there's there's a little bit more shared responsibility, you know, quote unquote in front of the camera, in front of the mic. But (laughs) also, you know, we we have tried to set a schedule for ourselves that allows us to do episodes episodes that are just us <laughs> so we can yeah. just talk and prepare and that's certainly much easier for the two of us to to schedule well I read like Tim Ferris was saying that he and I I know this but I never managed to do it he was like I have days for things so he's like okay let's say Friday is my recording day so I schedule all of my interviews on like the Fridays and I record mm-hmm. back-to-back stuff or not necessarily back-to-back if you're worried about time but like two or three in a day like with And then uh, this Mm -hmm. day is my editing day. And I'm like, I cannot work like this. My mind goes in a million directions. 
And thank God for Chad Liffman, my co-producer, because sometimes I'm just like, hey, can you please edit this? Because I'm like in the weeds with everything else. And he's like, all right. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. So is it just the two of you primarily, plus whoever your guest is that week? Yeah, that's it. It's just the two of us. And we did hire someone last season to edit some of the episodes because it was it was a really like we didn't have a lot of time of lead time to prepare. It was our first time booking a season where I had to really prepare for each guest. And I actually had to, you know, then re-listen to everything. It was very dense episodes and then make sure he got to know what to cut. But then I was like, even if it's not a lot of stuff and I could have finished the edit myself, it just, it was helpful to have somebody kind of deal with the technical aspect. But most of the time we edit ourselves and- we try, like I said, now to have season where we're like, all right, this is going to be the theme. We'll work on the artwork. I, I think Chad is probably frustrated with me being late because fandom I've been talking about for six months and then the summer I couldn't work. I was away. And then when, and then it took me a while because I was, I thought I had an idea, but then it's like a journalism stuff for me. I get really into it and I was researching it, pre-interviewing people. And I'm like, there's so much more to it. And then it becomes a whole thing. And now he's like, all right, we're supposed to drop next week. What, what's going on? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Is Chad in your recording sessions? Like, is he like a silent person in the background? Or no, it's just you and the guest? It's just me. And so what we do is at the beginning, he gave like, he gave me feedback on the questions. He was like, okay, here's what I think you should do. But then because again, it's still kind of chaotic, you know, sometimes he doesn't have time to give me feedback on the questions, but he will give me feedback afterwards. And then I try to implement his feedback for the next ones because, you know, he's really smart. And he, when he edits, he can make editorial decisions that I trust. But um, mm -hmm. I'm, I guess, the instigator of this podcast. And so I have like, I guess, most of the creative responsibility, but, you know, maybe I'll convince him to do some interviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's cool. And it's cool. I mean, as a person with two podcast co hosts, can confirm it's great. Love yes. having a co host to throw to. Yeah. Yeah. So, one question I have is if you had any like misconceptions about distribution before you started doing your podcast that changed once you really got into it and had a bunch of guests on? Yeah. I mean, I think it's more like I, I realized that even if I know a lot, I actually know nothing. It sounds so like Jon Snowy, but just like mm -hmm. <laughs> the more I interview people, the more I'm like, oh my gosh, it's just, there's so many things. Like one of my favorite interviews, which I met, didn't mention earlier was, uh, with Sonia Childress, who was at Firelight Media for like 16 years. And she's amazing. And she was kind of like, basically, well, you know, the premise of like the idea of like creative distribution is so different from what she focuses on, like in impact. And she kind of turned on its head, like a lot of the concepts that I took for granted. And, you know, that it, it can really become very specific when you have people who are super good at what they do when it comes to what does impact mean? What does distribution mean? What does impact distribution mean? And how people relate to also the work of ethics and accountability and documentary making specifically, how you work with your subjects, how, what does creating impact mean? And, you know, all the questions that we didn't ask ourselves before of like, how do you work with people in a collaborative way, people whose lives are in your film and what does that look like uh, you know when it comes to creating a campaign with those people in mind and how early mm -hmm. does it start another interview was with Maya Newell of In My Blood It Runs and it was the last season which was on the power of community and she had an amazing case study about collaborative filmmaking and distribution because it was working hand in hand with indigenous kids and families she she worked with and it was just I was like, okay, well, I know nothing about any of this. And there's so many other ways to like, what I did is kind of the basics. And it's great if you have a film that does well in those schools and corporations, but there's so many other questions surrounding documentary filmmaking as an art form and as a responsibility that then kind of get reflected in your distribution strategy and your impact strategy. That's cool. That's very cool. 
So creative distribution means something different to everyone who's creatively distributing. Well, I think, you know, we have the the term like the Sundance Fellowship kind of really standardized that and was good to say, this is what it means, splitting your rights so that you don't give all your rights to one entity. And that's great. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, what what does it actually mean if you want to create impact? And that's why Sarah Moses talked about impact distribution of like those things don't have to be at odds, like you making money. Mm -hmm. And, and so then you have so many other questions that, that come up, but yeah, it's a little bit complex, but I think the, the bottom line is I found that there's a lot more to it than just sustainability as a filmmaker, which was what originally drew me to it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more questions to ask yourself, like the kind of stuff you want to do as an artist, the kind of priorities you want to have and how you want your work to impact literally other people, including people in your film. And it it might be different for fiction film, narrative films. I mean, it is different, obviously. But um, I feel like it still kind of overlaps a lot because, you know, actors are real people and the way Mm -hmm. they're treated matters too in that realm in a different way. And the way a fiction film, you know, the responsibilities that come with that and the way that you're putting it out into the world and the messaging that that comes with it I think there are more overlaps than we think yeah I agree yeah I was going to ask what what if you had any experience in narrative filmmaking and any insight that you have there based on your time (laughs) but fair enough (laughs) I mean I interviewed like I said the the Just Mercy team their impact campaign it was a Mm -hmm. narrative film but it was based on true stories so for a complete, I, I mean, I, yeah, it's maybe for you guys for um, a completely, you know, like, let's say it's a film about two college girlfriends who do this, this or that. Like, I, obviously, the nuts and bolts are the same, but I, mm-hmm. I, I guess it might be a bit harder. I don't know. I mean, I can say, like, from my own experience and also from speaking to other narrative filmmakers, it is harder to prove that there is value like in the impact that you can have because it's usually more like emotional as opposed to sort of a fact-based push for policy change or something like that like a lot of time narrative film is about changing people's perspectives on like the humanity of people like you know if you made a film that's like a queer love story and obviously that does have an impact if you show it to conservative people who don't expose themselves to stories that aren't love stories about straight people, right? And so, like, there is a domino effect, but to say that it has, like, a direct impact on an Im- sort of immediate, like, issue, it's harder. And so then it's harder, I think, to, like, monetize for schools and and for organizations. It doesn't feel as straightforwardly educational. Right. Mm-hmm. But I do know that people have done it, especially when they've made like period pieces about turning points in like civil rights movements or social issues that that like tends to do really well in the narrative space. It's hard if you've made, you know, like a romantic comedy (laughs) to make the case that that's like doing bigger work than making people laugh, you know, for Mm -hmm. a random example unrelated to anything. (laughs) <laughs> just pulling it out of the hat maybe a queer rom-com yeah. um <laughs> yeah i mean that that's all very interesting stuff yeah as a person who's only worked in shorts so far this has just been very interesting to hear about so i am curious nora from your perspective obviously you know you you've your own documentary has gotten you a lot of work and i'm curious if your podcast has had an effect on your career either directly or indirectly and and can you speak to that to other women in film listening who might want to start a podcast to nerd out about their own niche it's hard to tell like it's I think, you know, it's it's afforded me the opportunity to meet really great people who I would not necessarily have the chance to, you know, it's like, why would you talk to that person? So it's it's a great way to meet people. <laughs> but um, I don't know if it's had a direct impact. I mean, I have been offered a few gigs, meaning like, oh, can you moderate this panel? Oh, can you talk to this person? Because, you know, I'm out there a bit more about this, but um, I don't think it has a dram- so far it hasn't had like a dramatic impact of like, oh, my God. Mm-hmm. But um, it's more like, I guess, if you're really passionate about something, it's a way to, like I said, build your network, but also your credibility. Like people are now, mm-hmm. OK, like, you know, you clearly care and know about this issue. So you're kind of more top of mind for certain things. It's almost brand building outside yeah. and, and less. Yeah, brand building. But uh, it's it's a very niche 
industry. I, like I, I should, I should stop saying that because it's actually kind of growing, but it's still mm-hmm. pretty niche what I'm doing. So it, it's different. I think for, I know some people have had, you know, podcasts of like the, the bachelor and whatever, and then those become viral and it's like, Oh my God, like your life changed. But that's not what I'm expecting to do with that. I wanted to just follow up really quickly on the previous questions about narrative, because I, I do mm-hmm. feel there are two things that I'm thinking about with that. Like one, I have seen some great narrative films, like you're saying, like a queer rom-com, whatever, who who mm-hmm. can really uh, have, and I don't know how they would, you know, play out, how that would play out to like do an educational campaign with it, but who, which really have had the opportunity to, to be seen as like, hey, you can make a difference with this film. So it's worth like showing. Also, there is a, some people who talk about, and I think it was Janelle, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Janelle Augustin, from NBC who was speaking at Duck NYC this week and she was like I'm really tired about this focus on impact because she runs the filmmaker fellowship she was like I think it's patronizing it's like pushing people to do charity and what she I'm paraphrasing it wrong but she was saying and I kind of agree is like you don't want to pigeonhole people and that's kind of how the funding world works especially in docs Mm -hmm. and maybe for film in general like pigeonholing it has to solve x and y and z and kind of the impact investing and distribution has become like this you know very specific thing and she was like there's value in a lot of different types of film a lot of different types of art and we don't want to become kind of this you know pushing people to do this what she called charity work of like sometimes there's something that is deeply wrong with the way the philanthropy industry or whatever ecosystem works. And you don't want to necessarily play into that. So I think there's a way to do it, right? It's more like there should be a place for all types of films to, you know, make a difference or not, just make you think, make you feel. And it doesn't have to be, yeah. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but. No, you are. You totally are. I think that's something that Brie and I like to sort of zoom out a little bit is our frustration in that because we both make like fun stuff like that's generally what we what we choose to make it's not like where there's obviously things that we care about within that and like certain types of representations that we care about within our work but for the most part we just want people to like escape and enjoy and I mean, in the case of me, like, I want them to also be scared because I make horror, but Brie often wants them to just, like, be charmed, <laughs> I would say. And and so it is hard when the only way to, like, get funding or get, pay like, monetary value out of your work because the only people that will pay for something on either end, either the front end or the back end, is if you can prove that there's, like, impact to be had when it's not always tangible and sometimes the less tangible aspect of it is like more has a bigger impact like it's more powerful in the long run because it's like creating a ripple effect of like a slight change right you know there's a reason why like tv shows there's a reason why like will and grace people went from like not wanting marriage equality to two years into it being on tv like the majority of america wanted marriage equality you know so it's like those things are not quantifiable Mm -hmm. in an immediate way but they are like emotionally you can obviously see it in big waves yeah shifting culture like you're you're shifting culture by putting those stories out there but yeah I mean I I agree 100% with basically you're moving the conversation and moving the culture in a certain way by making those films and that content it doesn't have to be like nail on the head like Here's A right. plus B impact. Right. But it can be very hard to then like prove that there's value if you're if if you're doing that, if you're being more mm. subtle, if you're not being quite as, you know, nail on the head, it's hard to then get funding or distribution. Like I find it's really hard right now to get distribution for something that isn't like addressing an issue, you know? So <laughs> like here's the thing that issue. I was thinking that back to your point. The thing that I just remembered. So there was a great interview on uh, creative distribution with Orly Ravid of the Film Collaborative. And mm-hmm. I kind of asked her that because she does work with a wide range of films, not just docs or whatever. And she said, here's the issue. She said, if you're doing like, like you're saying, you know, fiction or it's just like, it's a fun thing. It doesn't, it's not necessarily addressing a specific issue. She was like, no matter what happens to sell a film of any kind, you need a, a marketing angle, as you know, because you you worked in distribution. But so she was like, whatever it is, like she was like, 
if you don't have uh, top talent, like you're just making, you know, short film about this, that she, she, you need something, something that is going to hook people. It can't just be, uh, even if the film is amazing, maybe it's amazing. And then people are going to find it in festivals and it's going to find its audience, but you need a hook. So maybe it's like one of the actors is like this beloved CW actor. It's not Brad Pitt, but it's someone who has, you know, a following or, or it's like mm -hmm. this angle, like, you know, queer love or, or, you know, so it doesn't have to be necessarily like addressing an impact, but you need a marketing hook to sell it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I was just going to talk about grants for a second, because I think that was like something that you were saying, Christina, that that is something that has come up on this podcast in our just private conversations about financing and, and wanting to not always go the self-funding route, but especially with narrative, but even not just with narrative, grants seem like the ideal option, you know, like, hey, Art is important. Give me money to make it. But there's not a lot of opportunities for for grants. So Nora, you mentioned during the the distribution phase of your your uh, film, you mentioned that you didn't have grants. And I was curious from your perspective, like, did you apply and didn't get any? Did you think that that wasn't really the angle for you? What's your experience in in grants and advice maybe that you can give one way or the other? Yeah, I mean, for grants for us. We only got one, which was uh, a French-American uh, grant from the U.S. Embassy in France. And it was, I think, very much helped by the fact that I, I personally knew the person who was heading that program. And honestly, what I've seen from grants, and people may have different experiences, is that it's kind of a complicated world. Like, you work really hard to get very little money. And it got mm -hmm. a bit easier when people agreed to do the core application. So all the major grants that have the similar application, so you don't have to write different things for five different people. Mm -hmm. That was great, but it's still like you're working really hard to get 10, five, maybe 20K. That being said, mm -hmm. it's really, really helpful just to put your thoughts to paper and organize how you're going to pitch your film. So I think mm -hmm. there's absolutely value in the grant making process and like the application process as long as you take it as that of like this is me organizing my thoughts pitching my film learning how to talk about my film think through these things it, it forces you to think through it but then I'm not going to rely on it I'm going to put this aside you get a response in six months anyway and find <laughs> other other ways to get funded because when it comes to receiving those grants, I think it's kind of like winning the lottery, if I'm honest. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a good way to think about it, though. We kind of touched on that in Jerry Maravilla's episode last year, uh, talking about screenwriting competitions, is that it's often just useful to have a personal statement about your script, even if you don't get the fellowship or whatever, like, well, now you have a personal statement about it that you have hopefully learned something from, and, and that can be just as valuable. And also having deadlines to need to, you know, finish a rewrite for your script for also helpful, you know, the grant is imposing a deadline, you have to have this in by this time. So, well, that's a good external deadline to finish our budget with and, and make our pitch deck and all that kind of stuff. So that that in and of itself can be helpful. Take yeah. that away, filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Since we're talking grants and I'm currently reviewing applications for this panel that I'm on <laughs> that I'm not allowed to speak about, but one of my one of the things that I like just high level advice <laughs> is take those questions really seriously like how you answer the questions almost matter more than your work samples because from like the reviewer's perspective we're not really allowed to have like an opinion we're not allowed to say like is this good is this like objectively good because there's no way to really answer that with art right so like obviously production value is a factor like is your sound good and stuff like that but generally speaking we're asked to review stuff based on whether or not they understand their project and they have a plan for it that they can feasibly execute in the timeline the grant gives them and in the budget that the grant gives them. And so like that is really what I how I think you could actually get a grant <laughs> is by like really <laughs> taking those questions seriously and as Nora said like really figuring out what it is you're trying to say with your film what you're trying to do with your film. Because that's like, that's really where it's at. It's, that's great. It's, yeah. <laughs> no, that's useful. Very useful. I mean, I'm like reading so many ap applications right now that are just like, I'm going to submit it to festivals. And it's like, okay. <laughs> like, that's not <laughs> like, a that's plan. Not a plan. <laughs> that's, 
<laughs> that is not a plan. Yeah, for viewers at home, there's a lot of uh, face rubbing and face palming um, going on in the Zoom call right now. Uh, I would also say just high level, like on a marketing standpoint, like you might all not always have the same marketing hook per grant, per opportunity. So that's something else to remember is I think sometimes, especially newer filmmakers get freaked out, like what is the one thing I'm making this movie about? And even for a short, you may have two or three buckets. So like, you know, for my short film, Ace and Anxious, which I talk about a lot because it's a useful case study for branding, you know, it has two primary distinct focuses for asexual representation and for mental health representation. And they sometimes go together, but they are very frequently separate aspects of the film that depending on circumstance, you know, will come to the forefront more or less. So mm. uh, so don't feel like you have to pigeonhole yourself into like, I make movies about this. It's like you can make movies about two or three different things. And then oh, in the, the spirit of st strategy, just be strategic about when you bring those things out. You know, if I was applying for a grant for mental health representation, that would be the focus of the application versus. Right. You know. It goes back to Nora's sort of advice about reaching out to schools and and mm -hmm. organizations, right? Like making sure that they will care about this film. Like, why should they specifically care? Not just like, why should generally people care? Exactly. And not all of them are going to care for the same reason. Maybe Harvard has very different, you know, based on who they've programmed so far in the school year, maybe they have very different interests and, and things that they're looking for versus Yale. And I imagine, Nora, you found that. Yeah, no, I agree with everything you all are saying. So <laughs> I, I, th I think, no, I think what one thing that is just to remember for any type of work in film is just targeting the research. And it's kind of, it feels kind of annoying because you're like, oh, it's a lot of work. But if you're, if you're really passionate about your, your topic, hopefully it, it's not too much of a chore. Otherwise you hire someone to do it, but just for anything, whether you're reaching out to a journalist, whether like, you know, Christina is reviewing those applications, like you need to be really targeted, do your research. And yeah, there's a lot more to it than just like, you know, having Send in fun. an email, seeing what happens. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, Nora, I was going to follow up on, on something you talked about, like at the very beginning of this conversation, just like high level outreach advice, because like as a, a journalist, as a documentarian, I imagine you probably do a lot more as an impact producer, you probably do a lot more outreach than the average filmmaker. So the advice you've already given us is <laughs> create a fake assistant if you can't hire a real one, which I love <laughs> and have done. And I'm so glad someone else other than me is saying it. And you mentioned <laughs> keeping it short. Do you have any other high level advice uh, and targeting your audience? obviously like being very clear like this is why I'm reaching out to you not just anyone do you have any other outreach advice that you think filmmakers constantly like forget about or don't realize that that might be um preventing them from having the spread that they they deserve I I really can't emphasize enough the targeting because like I still to this day I receive emails when it's like no the person has not like really do your research for the person. Like, what are they talking about? What do they write about? Like, what's their latest Instagram post? Because sometimes people change. Mm -hmm. Also, you're like, oh, six months ago, they wrote about this. Now they really think the opposite because somebody convinced them otherwise. Like not being stalker, but kind of. Uh, mm -hmm. And then um, and then also and same like for a school, you're like, oh, great. Harvard Entrepreneurship Center. No, like what's happening now? Did a scandal happen last week? Like what's going on? Like did the person get ousted? Whatever. And then also... Really, the email, I think, has to be the sweet spot between why would it be great for you, but also pitching yourself a bit. Like, even if you didn't go to, like, a top festival, you're not a, a big name, like, something to kind of hook the person that this is legit. Like, partner names, like, a, a press thing, or, a, you know, even if it's a blog of whatever, like, someone, like, a testimonial. Someone said this is the best film since blah, blah, blah. Like, something to draw a little bit of buzz and, like, create a little bit of buzz and legitimacy around your project. But keeping it short and follow up. Oh my gosh, follow up. So mm -hmm. I never respond to the first email because most of the time I forget. Like, I'm just mm -hmm. like, I forgot, <laughs> I read it. And then I was like, who emailed this? So I can't even imagine for people who are like extremely busy, like, you know, especially if you're in a school, you're so busy. So it takes usually three to four emails. I'm like, I'm serious. And it doesn't mean oh, like, wow. it doesn't mean emailing That's someone every day. It's like, Send the first one, mm -hmm, then you right. follow up three days later, then a week later, then like, I remember like one person who ended up being a, a client or something like, yeah, for the first four emails, I, nothing. I was like, well, okay, should I actually announce last? Like, oh, thank you for pinging me again. Actually, I was thinking about you. And then people also, you know, a year later, they're like, oh, last year I didn't have any money. So I didn't respond. Now I have money, you know, so I think that's good advice. 
Very good <laughs> advice. I think one of my, like, just personally, I always worry I'm emailing too much. So, mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's good to, I'm like, after two emails, I'm just not going to bother again. No, but two emails is not enough. I should. Mm-mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would you also recommend trying to email on like different days of the week? Certainly not like late in the week. I try not to send like, you know, intro emails on like Thursdays and Fridays because I feel like unless I know this person is waiting for my email, they're kind of checked out. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think Mondays and Fridays suck. Mondays suck too. Like I think. Thir- yeah, because you're I, catching I, up from the weekend. Yeah, I think Wednesday, Thursdays is good. Like people are like less, okay. you know, I, I mean, I, I honestly email anytime, but yeah, especially if I'm busy and I need to do it, I just do it. But yeah, Mondays and Fridays are just less good. Uh, one thing I was going to mention is something I learned the hard way. And I think that kind of changed in the past, it was more okay to do it. And now the etiquette has changed even more so. Or maybe I was just, you know, slow to learn it is double opt-in introduction. So back in the day was kind of like you received me like, hey, I'm introducing you to so-and-so. And And it was kind of okay to do it. And I still receive those emails sometimes. But I've learned the hard way that it's not actually how you're supposed to do it. You're supposed, and I, like some people really pissed at me. Uh, You're supposed to like say, oh, you know what? This person would be great for you. Let me talk to them. You send them an email with a blurb about, Hey, Christina's working on this awesome thing or Bree's working on it. Would you, would, would you want, would you be okay to talk to her? Can I introduce you? If they say yes, you introduce them. Unless you really know the person super well and you know they're not going to be bothered. Most people are really not happy with like straight up introduction. Unsolicited without. connection. Yes. Yeah. I learned that the hard way. So I'm just saying <laughs> I would advise against mm-hmm. it. <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. I've been on the receiving end of both and like sometimes when it's someone I when it's like a really close friend and they're like can I introduce you to this person I'm like why are you even asking me like of course Mm -hmm. but then when if someone does it unsolicited and we're not close friends I get annoyed so it's also just helpful to know like context of like are you introducing me because you want them to leave you alone? Are you introducing me because you genuinely think like I I would be helpful? Like, just tell me right. what, what sh- <laughs> right. how much bandwidth should I dedicate to this person? I I will I'll I'll back that as good advice, definitely. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. So Nora, any final high level advice on creative distribution, on podcasting, on filmmaking as a career, on a recent kind of food you got really into that more people should try. What what are, what are your your last remarks that you want to leave us with? Well, I mean, one thing I've been thinking of is last week I was at Doc and YC and it was so nice to just be with people like again and see people. And I mean, I feel like it's so important. Like I I, I know I'm a broken record, but like building this community and it's hard because we're all so busy. We're tired. We have our own lives. But whatever it is, like just finding ways. And that's why I'm, I'm kind of like stalking people on social media often, because sometimes the only way you can be in contact with somebody, but just and stalking is not the right word, but like just mm-hmm. being present in each other's lives and like trying to create those opportunities to be together. And if it's not in person, like a Zoom or whatever, but we really need to keep strengthening community and build a collective power of this industry. And like as filmmakers, like stronger together, like it's it's not it's not a a cute word. It's like a survival strategy, literally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think filmmakers are less in competition with each other than we we like to imagine because like me liking one film does not preclude me from liking another. You know, once right. I'm done watching one movie, I need a new movie to watch. And and I think that it, f- more filmmakers that realize that they're not in competition with one another will probably find more fulfillment and community if they if they accepted that. Well, also, like, as you're just talking about competition, like, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a socialist. So obviously, I'm, <laughs> and I made a film about women tech entrepreneurs. So it's really ironic, I clearly had a, a different viewpoint at that time. But I'm just thinking, you know, <laughs> it's so artificial the way we're pitted against each other. And this is, mm-hmm. this is a strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, this is ridiculous. I do not care about competing for Sundance grant or whatever. I, I would rather we as a collective, get elevated all together because this is an artificial yeah. way to break the solidarity of the workers. 
That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a great place to go out on. Solidarity <laughs> to the workers. Everyone unionize or find ways of socially unionizing so that people stop doing this to us and they realize that we're actually the ones with the power. Yes. That's right. And we'll include a link to that great Medium post that you wrote a while back, mm -hmm. which... I think Thank it's you. a good companion. Thank yeah, so, so, some eagle-eyed followers may have seen it on social media a couple of months ago, but we will definitely share it again. Worth the read. Thank you. Thanks so much to Kelsey Rauber for our theme music, Kaylee Brown for our podcast art, Ezra Lee for editing this episode, and to all of you for listening. Links to learn more about them and our guest are in our episode description. And thank you to our booby VIPs, who are our $10 supporters on Patreon, including Kim Garland, Amanda Blunt, Anthony Epp, Kelsey Rauber, Norman Steinberg, Jerry Maravia, and Brandy Nicole Payne. If you want your name on that list and or to have access to our bonus resources related to each and every episode, you can subscribe for as little as $3 to our Patreon at patreon.com slash breaking out pod. Or join our free newsletter where we share a new creative prompt each month. Next episode, we'll be discussing our own podcast learnings. Be sure to tune in. <laughs>